My name is Ed Boyden. I'm an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab and also in bioengineering and neuroscience. And I lead a group that works on methods for controlling brain computations by using pulses of light directed at individual cells or at sets of cells to figure out how they work. If you can control cells in the brain, you can figure out what, they can, what their power is, what they can influence. And also, if you can control cells in the brain, you can potentially fix aberrant brain states. You could come up with new kinds of therapy, resculpting the computations that have gone awry in a neurological or psychiatric disorder. So starting back in 2000, I was very interested in collecting molecules that would allow us to control the brain with light. And there's a class of molecules that are naturally occurring that convert light into electrical energy. There's sort of a primitive form of photosynthesis. And of course, the brain is an electrical device. So if you can put these molecules that convert light into electricity into the brain, you can now control the brain with light. The brain's very heterogeneous. Unlike a computer, which is made of just a few circuit elements repeated over and over again, the brain is made of thousands of different kinds of cells. And these cells have different shapes, they have different molecules in them, and they project to different targets. So if we can target just one kind of cell with light, then we can turn it on or off, and all of its neighbors will be unaffected. So we can figure out just what that one cell type does, and if it's a cell type that's going wrong in a given disorder, we can fix it. We use reagents that come from nature. So there are many bacteria, archaebacteria, funguses, plants, and so on. Pretty much every kingdom of life, except for animals, actually, has these molecules that sense light and can convert them into electrical signals. These molecules sit in the membranes of cells. You can think of them as like little solar panels that coat cells. And when light hits them, they translocate charge from one side to the other, um, and that, of course, is an electrical signal. So we find the genes for these molecules. These are all genetically encoded. In these organisms, the DNA contains the recipe for making these molecules. So what we do is we take the DNA that represents the code for how these proteins are made, and we can put that into a little virus or a little cassette. And then that cassette we can put in any cell. We can put it into an animal cell, we can put it into a human cell, a cell line. Whatever we put it into, that cell now becomes controllable with light. By doing this, you can think of it as that cell that we put this little cassette into is now installing those solar panels on its membrane. It now becomes sensitive to light and is controllable with light. So there's two reasons why we want to use this tool. Um, we want to, to use this tool to understand how the brain works, parsing out how each part talks to the other. And also we want to prototype therapies. We want to figure out what are the targets that can be used to fix brain disorders. Now, of course, in the 20th century, there are many different technologies for addressing brain disorders. Pharmaceuticals, of course, which have been immensely impactful, although they often have side effects, and electrical stimulation. Electricity, of course, will go in all directions, right? It goes down the path of least resistance, which is partly where that phrase comes from. And that means that all of the cells nearby, the small ones, the large ones, the ones that inhibit, the ones that excite, all of them are going to be driven by the electricity. Now, in many brain disorders, some cell types are affected by the brain disorder, and others that are right next to them are not. What we want to do is be able to activate a given kind of cell, but not to perturb its neighbors. And that allows us to be much more specific than electricity. Whereas electricity goes everywhere, we can target our molecules just to some of the cells and not others. When we shine light on that piece of brain, only the cells that we have targeted our cassette of genetic material to will be responsive to light. In doing so, we can minimize the side effects that occur um, that are due to electricity, which will spread in all directions, or for a drug that might bathe all of the cells in a region, uh, affecting them uh, indiscriminately. So there's two ways that our work is having impact on the clinic. One is that certainly drugs and electrodes are very powerful for treating brain disorders. If you could find better targets um, using our optical methods, that might help people uh, figure out better drugs or electrodes, uh, electrode targets. Let me give a concrete example. Suppose that we can use our optical devices to go through the brain and turn off parts one by one. We can then pinpoint the exact circuits that are implicated in a disease, and that would then allow us to screen for drugs that affect that circuit, rather than drugs that target a molecule, which might affect other neural circuits as well. The second way that our work is having clinical impact um, is that preclinically, many people are interested in exploring the use of these tools in actual prototype treatments. So as an example, um, there's a group um, at Case Western that's using these tools um, in the spinal cord, and they've shown that uh, it, when you have spinal cord injury, you lose the ability to control, obviously, the part of the body below the spinal cord injury. So if I have a, a break here in my spinal cord, I can't control anything below it. If you could beam light at specific pathways in the spinal cord below the injury, then one can play back patterns of activity that can recapitulate some of the functions that are lost with a spinal cord injury. And they have a very nice result showing that they can take 
um, in, a, in a, a rat model of spinal cord injury. All these tests are done in animals before, they're done in humans, obviously, because that's the proper way to do a preclinical study to make sure it's safe and effective. Um, but they've shown that they can restart up the breathing circuit even after a spinal cord injury has prevented the ability to breathe, as an example. A second example, um, that's a, a collaboration that I'm, I'm part of uh, using our tools uh, directly, um, is a group at the U University of Southern California and also um, at the University of Florida, and we've also started a company to try and commercialize this idea. But there are many forms of blindness where you lose the ability to see, um, and the reason that you lose the ability to see is that you've lost the photoreceptors, the cells in the eye that capture light and transform those signals into signals the brain can understand. Now the rest of the eye is still there though, and so what we propose to do is to take the rest of the eye and make it sensitive to light using these molecules. Basically we're going to take the rest of the eye and turn it into a camera, even though the natural photoreceptors are gone. And if we can do that, and we have some proof of principle data that we're getting now that suggests that indeed in blind, models, uh, blind, blind mouse models, we can actually uh, equip them with enough vision that they can actually solve mazes and other problems, then we hope that this could be a way of treating many forms of blindness in which photoreceptors are lost. There are over 100 different mutations that cause humans to lose their photoreceptors. If we try to treat every one of them by fixing that individual gene, it could take a very long time. Here, we can come up with a single therapy, or candidate therapy at this point anyway, because it's all at the preclinical level, and we could put those into the, um, these molecules that are light sensitive into the eye, and all of these different disorders potentially could be treated by making the spared cells into cameras. So there's a number of really cool things that we think will emerge from this research in terms of direct impact on, on mental health research and mental health treatment. One is that we're working with a lot of people to try and find better targets in the brain for treating brain disorders. I'll give a concrete example. Um, we have a, a project that was funded by the Army, actually, to try and find targets in the brain that can be used to prevent or treat post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are traumatic events that cause people to have irrational, enduring fear and anxiety, which can continue for years and be very incapacitating. So we developed these optical fiber arrays that we can use to beam light into different parts of the brain, and we can now turn on or off these parts and figure out, hey, does this part of the brain or this pathway or this cell affect or prevent um, the PTSD state. And indeed, we now are finding a couple targets which can indeed seem to have the ability to prevent or, or treat these disorders. So those insights can now go back into the clinic. People can target electrodes to those regions. People can try to find drugs that selectively affect those targets and not their neighbors. The second thing, of course, is that we are uh, doing a lot of preclinical work to try and figure out if these technologies can be used in humans directly. For example, in 2009, we published uh, the first preclinical study where collaborating with various investigators who work with non-human primates, which is sort of the gold standard for evaluating neurotechnologies, uh, we gave them our reagents and they looked in non-human primates to show that indeed these reagents are safe and effective and therefore might be appropriate if future studies can confirm these studies that we have published uh, for human treatments. And so we're very excited about that. Ordinarily, one might not expect these proteins from algae and plants and fungus and bacteria to be safe in the body. Um, and yet we're finding in these preliminary studies, um, and hopefully if they continue to be borne out, we will be able to, to, to move these forward, um, that these can express in cells similar to human cells and to do so safely and effectively over periods of months to years.